Welcome to the mom room. Take off your shoes. Relax because shit's about to go down. I'm just kidding. Um, I want to actually preface this episode by saying while I don't agree with everything that they are saying, I want to look into a lot of the research studies that she is referencing because I have a feeling they're all correlational and there's lots of confounding variables. I'm not like coming at them. You know what I mean? Like I don't want this to be like some big battle. I just want to share a different perspective and also share the thoughts that came to mind as I was listening to their episode. So my plan for the future is to get an expert, hopefully Dr. Tanya Kotler, who is, you know, an expert in attachment, the most expert that you could possibly be. Um, I don't necessarily know the training that the woman in this episode had when it comes to attachment, but I think Tanya said it was similar to her training, but I have to look into that Um, because I don't think she's a clinical psychologist. Anywho, I'm not going to talk about that because I didn't freaking look much into it. I did look into it, but I don't remember. So this video, so many people were sending me this video on Instagram and being like, oh my God, can you talk about this? Can you talk about this? And I was like, what the hell? So I watched the video and because when so many people are sending you the same video, like you have to look at it, you know, you got to be like, what's going on? So I look at the video and clearly they took a bunch of clips from the episode and they made it very clickbaity and highlighted kind of what would be considered controversial thoughts or controversial things that were said in the episode that people would be like, oh, what? Oh my God, I got a click, which is exactly what I did. I went to the YouTube page and I watched the full episode. And I have three sheets of paper front and back with notes from that episode. I still have 10 minutes left of it to watch, but like the gist of it, obviously I have. The episode's like an hour and 45 minutes, first of all, like holy moly. Um, Every time there was something that I wanted to address or like talk about or just like share for this episode, I would pause it and then go write my little note and then go back. So it took me literally forever to watch this episode. Um, The first thing I want to say is that I agree with the overall dilemma that she is presenting in the episode. So... The whole, like, 43% of mothers end up leaving the workforce. I need more information on that statistic. But the way she's approaching the dilemma of childcare and motherhood and new parents and having children, like, that whole debacle, like, be remaining in the workforce or, you know, taking a leave from the workforce getting a paid leave, like that whole debacle, especially in the U.S. Just as a note, I am Canadian. We, for the most part, have 12 months paid maternity leave. Unless you're an entrepreneur, unless you're self-employed, um, then you don't, which is, I even think that's an issue and something needs to be done for that. But anywho, she is obviously located in the U.S. where they have nothing, literally nothing. Like businesses, organizations, employers are not required to give parents, mothers, fathers, anything. So if you do get something, it's like they're, it's their decision. So I agree with the problem that she is presenting in this episode. However, she is approaching the problem as it's something that women have to change. It's something that women should feel bad about. It's something that we have to figure out and fix. And 
the workforce, the government changing policy for employers, like nowhere do they talk about that, which is upsetting for me. And it's interesting because the woman that she was interviewing, I believe her name was Erica. She said, and I loved that she said that she actually, um, what's it called? Like goes to the White House and like is in kind of like the political sphere to try and implement change when it comes to paid maternity leave. That's great. That's amazing. That is actually incredible. And I always think to myself, like, how are there not riots in the street over maternity leave, paternity leave, all the leaves? Like, how is how are there not riots in the freaking street? Because honestly, after giving birth to Milo, before I became a mom, it was like, oh, wow, they don't have maternity leave. Like, I didn't even know what that meant. I didn't know how important that would be. I didn't know what recovery was like. I didn't know what the emotional ups and downs of early postpartum was like. I didn't know how much sleep I wouldn't get. Do you know what I'm saying? But after I had Milo, I was like, wow, the fact that the U.S. does not have any sort of paid parental leave when you have a child blows my mind. It's inhumane, literally inhumane. But I digress. So I loved that she said that. I feel like I agree with a lot of things that she says and I like where she's going with things. But I do think a lot of the things that she says are very matter of fact. It's like anything with all these like major parenting questions. As soon as you see things in a black and white, like daycare is all bad and staying home with your kids is all good. As soon as you start to look at things in that way, like you lost me because there's so much nuance when it comes to these major parenting choices. And she doesn't talk about any kind of nuance. It's like, no, it's bad. Mm, No, it's not. So anywho, these are my notes. Bear with me. So she was saying, oh, also in Canada, I should point out that you have the option to take up to 18 months maternity leave in most uh, positions. So when I was just speaking offline with Dr. Kotler about this episode and that I was hoping in the future her and I could speak about this topic, she was saying that Canada, or no, she was saying that children, the best time for children to start to attend a child care center is 18 months for the most part. Obviously, there's going to be like, this not like a, a cutthroat. It's like any kind of like developmental milestone. Like kids are going to vary. Okay. Um, so it's nice that Canada has up to 18 months. Now, if you're self-employed, if you're you have a certain position, like not everybody has the opportunity to do 18 months. Erica, the lady on this episode, her name's Erica now, um, she was suggesting what she thinks is ideal is 12 months maternity leave. This is another thing. Never did they acknowledge paternity leave. Never. Every single thing that they talked about was on the mom. Everything was about the mom, motherhood, everything, nothing to do with paternity leave. In Canada, you can alternate. So you could have your husband, your partner take the full 12 months paternity leave and you take eight months, or sorry, Renee, do math, six months maternity leave. You could do six months maternity leave, six months paternity leave. Do do you know what I'm saying? Like you can switch off so that the, the father can take time as well, paid time off as well. And it is quite common. I know lots of people whose husband's father of their children has taken a chunk of time for paternity leave while the mom went back to work. So when when I 
talk about something being nuanced, what I'm trying to say is that a stay-at-home mom can be worse off and vice versa because so many factors come into play. I do think that some children developmentally, their temperament, how they interact with other people, how they Like, are they super withdrawn and not outgoing? Just like anything, even when you think about adults, like some adults thrive in social situations, some do not. Like, I think kids are the same way. And I think you're going to have some kids that will do great in daycare and some that maybe should not be in daycare for a while. If it were feasible, for us to choose that option. A lot of the times families cannot, they're not afforded the opportunity to choose. It's like they either have to go to back, go back to work or they don't. So it's not just a matter of being financially able to stay home. I think what also has to be considered, which she does not even want to consider at all. She's She says like, no, the mom needs to completely just turn off her wants, needs, you know, goals, filling her cup, whatever it might be for three years. Because what she suggests is optimal is the mom take 12 months and then the mom is given the option to work part-time or casually for the next two years. So she does not recommend any child go to any kind of childcare center, daycare, um, where there's multiple kids for three years. Okay. So they acknowledge that, you know, maybe families need to start living with less money and like, it just, it blows my mind because everybody is already so like the cost of living is nuts. Nuts. And so now you have to look at it as, okay, if we're taking away a a full income from the family, what kind of detriments is that going to lead to? What kinds of things will be taken away from the family if we made that decision? In the hopes that the mom staying home with the kids for up to three years is the best. Like what's the like give and take, like ups and downs, pros and cons, right? Also, like my question was, what about people that have multiple kids? Most people I know have multiple kids in a row, like boom, boom, boom. So now what happens? If mom is not able to go back to work, and as she mentioned in the episode, a lot of parents or a lot of women, men, whatever, are having kids later on in life. So my husband and I, we had Milo when I was 34 because my husband did medical school. He did residency. I did my master's. I did my PhD. Then we had a child. So if we had multiple children, I would still not be working. So what employer in their right mind is going to hire me after I graduated in 2020 and I'm still not working and it's like 2026. I've just like dabbled here and there. And also, what job is going to hire me when I'm like, I'm just going to work part time? Because she recommends that you only work a couple hours a day, five days a week. Okay, that sounds lovely, but that is not the world that we live in. Like, um, yes, uh, can you work, you know, X number of hours in a week? Yes, but just in 15 minute pockets spread throughout the week so that I'm not away from my child. And I know I sound like, it's just never was it acknowledged that the workforce would never change to to be that way. Like it just doesn't work. 
And a lot of the conversation was surrounding having one kid. You know, if you have multiple in a row, then what? Mom is just never working and she went and got, you know, 10 plus years of post-secondary education for what? Also, acknowledging that mom's career is probably filling her cup. You know, a lot of my friends, a lot of women that I know, their work and their career, having that life outside of the home is really fulfilling and makes them overall a better human and better mom at the end of the day. So you have to acknowledge everything. You have to look at the big picture, which they absolutely did not. Um, One quote that I wrote down here was, daycare should be a last resort. Completely disagree. I just posted a reel of an episode I did with Dr. Morgan Cutlip and my Sean, the guy that makes my clips, pulled out the part where I'm like, I started to quickly realize that daycare was an opportunity for my child. And this was before the age of three. It was an opportunity, in my opinion. And they say, nope, not not a chance. Um, and apparently they have all this research to back it up. And so I am going to look at some of the studies that they mentioned. I have such a feeling that it's correlational, guys. I just really do. Um, so they focus a lot on the word prioritizing and that in the first three years, kids need you. And then again, there's like a really vulnerable period between the ages of 9 and 25, which can be considered adolescence. Um, Daycare is the most problematic form of childcare, but the most common in the U.S. She says, the U.S. is the most uncivilized country in the world. There's a lack of a paid maternity leave, honestly. Like, I agree. That is wild to me. Like, talk about living the American dream. Like, what the fuck? Like, that is wild to me. Anyways, I'll never get over that. So, the reason I wanted to talk to Tanya about this is that they talk a lot about attachment. So, she is saying that the attachment experience happens over a three-year period where they need the security and the safety of their mother. Again, I was screaming at the the screen like, what about dad? What about dad? Um, They get basically what they were saying. Honestly, guys, if you're a little bit nervous about daycare, don't listen to that episode because it is the way they phrased things was just so like, so matter of fact, like taking things and generalizing them to every single child care situation. Like it just blew my mind. They said, basically what's happening is that you have your baby, they get attached to you, and then you ditch them with strangers for eight to 10 hours a day. Okay. Um, daycare kids have increased cortisol and they use that argument for sleep training as well. And my question to that is, okay, for how long? For how long do they have increased cortisol? Is it all day? Is it for the full two years of daycare until they hit age three? What? Give me more. Like, children in daycare have increased cortisol. Okay, tell me more. Tell me more because I have questions. Um, Are you checking the cortisol throughout the day? Is it just that drop off? Is it for if your child starts daycare at 12 months? Do they have increased cortisol every single day for eight to 10 hours a day when you ditch them with strangers for two years? Tell me more. I need answers. Um, Stress under 12 months is not good. This is what they have said. Um, Do, do, do. Then there was talk of mom guilt. And... Dr. Tanya Kotler and I talked about this briefly and they are saying that 
right now there's like this movement among moms to suppress our guilt, you know, to be like, oh, don't feel guilty about that. And they're saying that's bad. You should not be doing that. And I disagree to some extent. Do I think there's some things that guilt is warranted for and actually would have a negative effect on your child? For example, if I buckled Milo in the car seat and we stop at a red light and I notice that I didn't do it tight enough and I don't pull over and fix it, that guilt is warranted. You know, what if something were to happen? So that guilt is good because it is leading to a behavior change that is actually beneficial. If it's Saturday afternoon and we're watching Toy Story, but it's sunny outside and I can't sit there and enjoy watching a movie with my child because I'm ruminating about how I should be taking him to the park. I should be going outside with him, even though we were outside all day yesterday and all morning and we're going outside this evening. That is not constructive guilt. That is just not allowing me to enjoy watching a movie with my child on Saturday afternoon. So I disagree. I agree, but I also disagree. Again, they're like saying these things and making it like a blanket statement. Like we should not be suppressing or trying to let go of any kind of guilt. I disagree. And she is saying that doing that is a disservice to moms because you're uh, telling them to you're telling them to avoid guilt um which is indicating that they're in an internal conflict that, that that they probably should be in is what she's basically saying so if you feel mom guilt you should because obviously you feel mom guilt for a reason because you know what you're doing is bad is what she's trying to say Um, One research study she talks about is called the Kibbutz Experience. And allegedly, it is showing that there are years of mental illness and attachment disorders. She labels them as attachment disorders, which just bothers me. Um, Years of mental illness and attachment disorders because of daycare. It's a longitudinal attachment study. So secure attachment in the first year of life indicate or predicts that you're going to be secure as an adult. Disordered attachment in the first year of life predicts is like a predictor of being disordered in adulthood and having mental illness. Yikes. Uh, Evidence that shows treating children as if they are objects which is if you send your child to daycare, apparently you're treating your child as an object. Um, Definitely looking into that study. Like, let me circle it right now because you guys know I love to look at these research studies that people like to um, quote and bring up to try and prove their points. Babies are resilient. Apparently that is something that we just say to appease us in being able to do whatever we want as adults and research actually shows the opposite. Babies are not resilient. Okay, I don't know if I agree with that. But again, to what degree? Like, I'm sure they are resilient for many things and not for others. It's the blanket statements that I can't stand. If you don't sacrifice for the first three years of your child's life, there will be hell to pay later. But not for everyone. There's always survivors of a shipwreck. <laughs> my, that's the quote from the, the episode. And my little comment below it was, oh my God, the drama. <laughs> like, there's always survivors of a shipwreck. Like, yeah, my child went to a beautiful, lovely child care center for two years of his life. Fucking shipwreck. Like, he survived. He's a survivor of daycare. Guys, I can't. Um, Okay. We don't have empathy. We are all narcissists. Everything about parents and what's best for moms slash self-care. 
they're saying like that's what the vibe is nowadays everything's about parents we don't have empathy we are narcissists um it's funny because on the other side of you know parenting content stuff it's the complete opposite it's like Never in history has there been a time where parents have spent more time with their children and been so concerned about their development, their nutrition, their physical activity, their screen time. Like never in history has there been a time where parents have been so involved with their children. But but now we're saying that parents nowadays are narcissists and everything's about the parents. Well, which is it? I kind of agree with the research where it said working mothers today spend more time with their children than stay-at-home mothers in the 70s. Let that sink in. Um, if you focus on yourself and not your children, there are consequences to that. Lots of threats in that episode. Um... How much time are we at? Oh my God, I've already been talking for 26 minutes. I'm only on page three of my notes. Okay, I'm just going to finish this first chunk. So the better options that they're suggesting instead of daycare, if you must work and you can't afford a single caregiver, so the best choice would be having someone that is like a family member or a, a close friend, like relative, watching your child long term so that they build a connection with that person. Uh, If that's not possible, then she mentioned something called share the care where you with another family share a nanny so that there's still a low ratio of kids to caregiver, if that makes sense. But I mean, she was saying that, for example, Milo's daycare was... Up until 18 months old, I think it was, I want to say six babies to two teachers because she's saying like that's unheard of. Like you, there's at least five to six babies per, uh, work, like childcare worker, teacher. And I don't know, like, I don't know if we're set up differently in Canada Not every daycare takes kids that are under 12 months old, but I'm pretty sure up until 18 months for Milo, it was six kids, two teachers. Because her argument is why it's so stressful for babies is because one teacher can't soothe four to five kids at the same time. I don't know. Apparently, that's what happens all day, every day at daycare. Everyone is just distressed, crying, having to be soothed all at the same time for the entire day. It's just bizarre to me. Like, can we just fucking talk reality? You know what I'm saying? Like, all this, like, doom and gloom and, like, okay, maybe that happens once in a while. It's the same as if a mom has twins or multiple young children And they're all freaking out. One has to eat. She's trying to breastfeed and the other one's like still in his car seat throwing a fit. You can't go and soothe that baby. Like if you're driving on the highway and your child is throwing a tantrum, losing their goddamn minds in the back seat, you're stuck. Like these situations are going to happen regardless. But I guess I just, maybe I just don't understand. Um... How can we better daycare, childcare? Why is daycare so much worse? Oh, these are my notes. This is what bothered me. The And I'll kind of end on this. So they talked for an hour and 45 minutes about why daycare is terrible and how we're messing up our children. There's been like two decades of adults now that have attachment disorders because they were put in daycare and it gets even better. They talk about postpartum depression and how it's not hormones. It's actually like what happened in your childhood and so on and so forth. It just blew my mind. But never were they like, you know what? Listen, we understand that the workforce is not set up in a way to allow 
moms to do what I think would be optimal for children. So here are some things that you can do with your child to ensure a secure attachment, to um, recognize if they are struggling with their attachment. Like, never was there any kind of help. It was like, if your child goes to daycare, you're fucked. And shipwrecks and survivors. Help us out. Like, how can we improve the bond with our child if we do have to send them to childcare because cost of living is so high and we've already set up our life as a double income and we had a child and I don't want to give up my career like help us out because it's not feasible like what she is suggesting is not feasible although anything would be better in the states and I acknowledge that like that's a huge problem uh But with regard to like staying home for three years and just working part time, like a few hours a day, Monday to Friday, like in what world is is that going to be feasible for people? So I also found it to be quite disrespectful for childcare teachers and daycare workers because our experience was incredible. And they even got into like, what about people who say like, oh, our daycare is amazing and the teachers are amazing. And like, that would be me. Like, I'm that person. And she was like, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And like, I'm sorry, but that pisses me off because I'm thinking back to the relationships that Milo had with his teachers in daycare how amazing it was, how like he would hurt himself and I would go to pick him up or like he had a fever and they're just like cuddling him in the office and he was so secure. Like I loved and obviously I can pick up on a secure attachment. Like that's what I'm trained in. I understand these things. I loved that he was building secure attachments with other adults That made me so happy that he had multiple people. Like I talk about the modern day village. Like he had that with multiple people. And when they're talking about like the increased cortisol, like, yep, maybe for the first like week when they're just getting used to their new environment. But to say that they're going to have increased cortisol and it's going to cause like their amygdala to enlarge and like major like long-term issues of mental illness and attachment disorders as adults like it just it's a lot to digest um so yeah I found it very disrespectful to daycare teachers who literally give everything and are so caring and warm to our children so much so that we consider them a part of our village And, like, I had teachers from Milo's school babysit him in our home. Like, that's how comfortable I was with them and how much I loved the way they cared for Milo. So, lots of things to say about that one. So, all my notes that I just ranted about are up until 33 minutes and 9 seconds of the YouTube video if you're going to go watch. Um, Obviously, it's a popular episode because so many people, it's clickbaity, right? Like so many people have their children in daycare and to hear an educated, well-respected person be like, daycare is terrible. They're going to be mentally ill when they're older. Um, But maybe not because (laughs) shipwrecks also have survivors. It's just a lot, guys. So I will share the rest of my notes in a future episode. I will also try my best to get Dr. Kotler on to give a more, you know, scientific um, approach and also look at the research studies. But I just have so many things to say. And it's just, it really upset me that to think that especially at that age where your child is young and you're having to 
send them to daycare. Like it's already difficult enough. And now we're having to listen to this. It's just, it's a lot. Anywho, that's it for me. I didn't even give any update on anything else. That's why I need a daily solo because I have so many things I want to talk about. But anywho, thank you guys so much for listening. And I will see you on Tuesday, which is Halloween. That's Halloween in French. All right. Bye.